Hello and welcome to the latest Bottom Line podcast from the Blood Red channel with myself, Matt Addison, and our business of football writer, Dave Powell. Liverpool have this morning announced their financial accounts with the impact of the pandemic becoming clear. We're here with all of the analysis of what we know so far and what might still be to come. The figures released are for up to May 2020, so this season is not covered. The pandemic only accounts for three months in these and there will have been another 12 months or so to factor in with COVID in the next accounts, which will come out this time next year. Let's start, Dave, by sort of picking apart the headline figures that the club have announced. Let's go into a little bit of, of detail, really, on each of the three main strands of, of the accounts and sort of the, the bottom line, if you like, to take the title of this podcast for, for what all of that means. So, yeah, it's it, <clears throat> unsurprisingly, this has been a, a, a year of uh, heavy losses for, for Liverpool in terms of seeing their revenues decrease, as we've seen across the board from clubs um, having no fans in stadiums, having to pay a rebate back to the broadcasters for what happened during Project Restart. All these things are, are taking their toll. Um, as you said at the top of the top of the program, all we've got so far is this. This takes into account um, a very short period of kind of a COVID affected finances. I mean, it won't be till next year where we see the true extent. But what, what it does show is this media revenue is down fifty nine million to two hundred two million. Uh, match day revenue uh, a thirteen million hit down to seventy one million, um, and commercial revenue was somewhere where they did see an uptick of twenty nine million to 217 million because they had eight new partnerships come on board um, and existing partners extended deals such as Nivea and Carlsberg. So there is some uh, elements moving in the right direction, but understandably um, there are a lot heading in in the opposite direction. Um, Most notably the the media revenue. I mean, there were matches played um, during the project restart, which meant there was going to be a a rebate to broadcasters which is being felt um over the next couple of years so it's going to be um it's going to be lean times i think uh certainly for next year um but it's going to be uh everything overall it equates to a an overall revenue dip of of, of 43 million on to to 490 million when you compare that to last year um we had revenues in excess of 550 million um but obviously all that was on the back of Champions League success um, and, and all the benefits that, that came with that. Um, so, yeah, it's it's not as bleak as some, but um, it's still, when you compare it to last year, it's certainly not what, um, what, what, what the owners would have been hoping for. Yeah, I mean, revenues being down 43 million, I think that's about what I would have expected, to be honest. I don't know about you. I mean, what do you think this means moving forward? Obviously, Liverpool have had recent investment from Redbird. Does that sort of remain the case that that will essentially cancel out the impacts of the pandemic? And is there anything that we've seen here that that might change that? Or or is that still the case? I think it it goes as it is. I mean, we we are now, um, we've just received these financial statements for the year ending May 2020. Um, And... And the reality is that the, the the club already know pretty much what the financial statements would look like for the year ending May 2021, but we won't see them till next year. So they'll know full well what the actual overall picture of this is going to look like. Um, and I think that's what accelerated the the, the plans to to get Redbird involved, um, to, to enable them to keep up a number of projects, I think, um, and to try and find some value um, where they probably don't, I mean, generate as much as they'd like. Um, Jerry Cardinal from Redbird is, um, has, has a, a long history of um, generating good revenue streams from um, media outlets. Um, he's, he's been a huge part of the Yes Network in, in the States, which kind of is a regional broadcaster network, which shows New York Yankees games, etc. And they're quite good at uh, monetizing the content around that so there may be some ideas there but also i think it allows um fsg um who are obviously at the moment under considerable amount of pressure um the ability to move forward um it, it's almost to stand still if anything uh, because it means that they don't have to put too much um of what they were planning on hold it means they can proceed with certain things i mean they'll have to borrow some money if they want it likelihood to to redevelop Anfield Road and um, but this investment could well mean that the idea about purchasing more sporting entities to go alongside their portfolio continues um, or 
it's simply a case of of just allowing um, the club to operate in the fashion it would have done pre-pandemic in the transfer market. Although I don't think that this money isn't going to be specifically put aside for that. It just means that it will allow them to. Um, they don't have to dig deep and find other areas of, of finance to do that. I mean, they'll they'll have that in the back pocket. So yeah, it, I think it just enables them to stay still almost um, and, and proceed with what they were they were going to do, as opposed to coming in and, and creating these whole fantastic kind of revenue streams. Because at the moment, and we know for the for right now and, and for the next twelve eighteen months, it's going to be um, be very difficult indeed. We've been through the numbers that they have told us. There are obviously other bits of the accounts that we don't know the details of yet. What are Liverpool not telling us so far and, and why might that be? Um, I think it's what we don't know. So, I mean, the club will know pretty much now what um, this looks like for um, next year even. So I think that the consensus is that... Um, among football, across footballers, that next year will be bad, and it will be bad for Liverpool too. But when you it, it, when you put that into context, it's how bad is it compared to their rivals? Um, and uh, the guess would be uh, not as bad. I mean, the, the the rough estimates we've seen are this pandemic could end up costing Liverpool um, around the 120 million mark. But of course, we don't know when fans are going to be coming back into stadiums. You don't know exactly when all of these revenue streams are going to kick in. Is the Premier League deal going to be worth as much as it was? Um, or as much as they wanted it to, um, in light of um, the pandemic and uh, the Super League. How, so all these things at play at the moment. Um, what is interesting is that there's, um, I mean, Liverpool haven't borrowed any money um, to, to get themselves through this um, so far. I mean, we've already seen the likes of Arsenal and Tottenham have, have, have taken um, financing options available to them uh, in order to, to meet obligations and to, and to, make sure the business moves forward and they're able to 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 operate. Um Liverpool haven't had to call on any kind of credit facility at the moment, which suggests that they're in a fairly strong position um on the balance sheet um in terms of how the business is managing itself. Um but of course it's a, it's a business and they want to make sure that it makes as much money as possible. And it's no we we spoke about this on on the podcast last week um about how it's no coincidence that the Super League um kind of arose because um there is an not there's a need for some clubs to to make more money notably in spain i don't think um the premier league clubs have that need ever want to make more money and just to ensure they stay ahead of the competition um but given the fact that the uncertainty over covid you can see why they kind of pushed for the super league even though it was um, it, it was total self-interest um but yeah i think next year we'll, we'll, we're really going to see the true effects of it uh, but as I said before, Liverpool haven't you exhausted any credit facilities which are available to them, or or any um, any kind of government loans or anything like that. So I think they're they're probably in a in an okay position, um, and I, I think that when we see next year, um, it will be offset somewhat by um, the fact that we haven't seen a number of commercial deals which have been struck in uh, the past twelve months appear in, in this set of accounts. And in terms of other clubs around the Premier League, for example, how will this compare to them? Because I suppose we're going to see this sort of thing in club accounts of all of, of the top clubs, the bottom clubs, all those in the middle. It's going to be you know, a, a loss and it, it's going to be a similar sort of picture, maybe not the same numbers, but a similar sort of pattern, not just for Liverpool, but for the entirety of the Premier League. I, I think it's the case across, across Europe. I mean, who, who, who's really making money? Uh, now we've got TV broadcast rebates to factor in um, the, the transfer market. You've already started to see the knock-on effect of that. It's it's become a bit more, uh, a bit softer. Um, the the main, some of the main players who are usually hovering around now, um, and the money seems to be less quoted as well. I mean, we went through that period about two or three years ago where it seemed it was only a matter of time before we were breaking three, four, five hundred million pound for players. Um, obviously, that's been been reined back in now, and, and the. There just isn't the marketplace for, for some of these clubs to dip into now. I think you're seeing that. Um, I think a lot of the teams are protecting what they kind of have um, moving forward. Um, but there is going to be opportunities um, because I mean, time moves forward and, and, and there'll be new players coming into town with, with, with kind of broadcasting. So Amazon and, and DAZN and people like that will be coming into play. So it'll be interesting to see what 
um, happens in terms of the broadcasting deal, whether it actually will, whether it remains stagnant, um, whether it, it, the dial moves backwards, which I don't think it will, um, or whether there are new new kind of street, you know, kind of avenues that they can explore um, with this deal and, and the ad advance of technology and, and people's changing habits to, to kind of make more money. But reality is, it's the Premier League is. Um, We'll, we'll be okay. I think the, the major fires are burning, um, certainly outside the, the Premier League and in the Championship in English football and, and across Europe. Um, I think the Premier League is more um, kind of fireproof than, than some, I think, to, to the effect of the pandemic. But we, we just don't know when normality will return to, to make these kind of revenue streams return to what they were because it, it's impossible to, to kind of put a finger on that. We all hope it's going to be soon, but we just don't know. Yeah, I'm sure hopefully we'll see a, a great number of, of fans back in the ground at some point next season. But as you say, we just don't know quite when that is. So obviously the knock-on effect of that, we can't quite judge at this moment in time. I mean, we'll just move on for a second uh, from the, the accounts. I wanted to, to ask, obviously, you reported over the weekend of a, a possible £3 billion takeover bid directed at Liverpool FC or certainly directed towards FSG. What do we sort of know about that at this moment in time? Is there any indication at all that FSG might be open at the right price to, to moving on from Liverpool? Well, it's important to say that the, the report service first off from, from the Mirror, it, was, um, it wasn't something which was uh, on the horizon, certainly in the past couple of weeks, we thought. But um, from what I've been told from, from people in the US, um, who are fairly well placed, is that there is no intention for for FSG to, to sell the club. Um, they are they have been badly bruised by what's gone on um, this past week. And I think there's probably an acceptance that John Henry's apology, um, while it showed contrition, I, I think that it's going it's to have to go a lot, a lot further than that for a lot of fans to be to be won back over. I mean, it was a it was kind of a, an affront on them. Um, on the very traditions of English football, and it's not going to be forgotten anytime soon. Um, but ultimately, FSG um, and Henry and, and Tom Werner are, are business people, and this is uh, Liverpool are an enormously important part of their portfolio. I mean, the, the, the overall uh, FSG operations valued over seven billion dollars, and, and, and of that, you know, Liverpool come in probably about the, about the three billion dollar mark, um, maybe slightly more. Um, and, and obviously got the Boston Red Sox in there as well. The whole idea of, of them bringing on Redbird Capital was to try and expand that portfolio. Um, and Tom Werner himself, a couple of weeks back, said that it would take an insane offer for them to consider selling Liverpool. I mean, whether they consider um, that three billion to, uh, reported takeover bid um, to be an insane offer, I don't think they do because I think um, there's some other fairly, you know. Ambitious estimates from from Forbes about them being about the you know about the three billion mark um, in terms of sterling um, that seems to be overinflated. Um, however, would they sell if their offer was right? I don't know. It's one of those things that you, only John Henry knows how um, how badly burned they've been from this and whether this is something that they they feel that they can't turn around. Um, but while a business makes money or while it has a potential to make money past the, the pandemic, um, I don't see them moving on. I mean, that's my personal opinion. Um, and I, I do think that maybe if there was to be a change of ownership, um, it would be more gradual. Um, we already have Jerry Card now through Redbird Capital on the, you know, as part of the the, the board at FSG and, and one of the partners. So would there be an element of, of exploring a, a further relationship between that, that's been suggested. Um, but but for me, I, I don't see them selling it in the face of this. I don't think it will embolden them to to, to do more. I just think it will... Um, I, I just don't think it will shake them out of their way of thinking to, to think that they just need to get rid of it because they've been embarrassed. Uh, of all the clubs to, to who won't be sold, I don't think, during this period, I think Chelsea and Manchester City sit at the, the summit of that um, because of their owners and, and the fact that they were probably the, the two teams who were least keen to to go with the Super League and they, and they went along with it because they didn't want to be left outside the tent, I suppose. Um, but in terms of finance-wise, all it would have done is, is help other teams kind of catch up to them and bridge that gap with them. Um, uh, whereas 
we, we've we've seen reports today that um, the Glazers are, are open to uh, selling Manchester United. Whether that's true, we'll have to wait and see. But um, I, I'd say Arsenal and, and Manchester United would be more likely to fall before um, FSG, considering selling Liverpool um, because it's formed such an important part of their their business model and their overall business model. Uh, and businessmen don't retire really; they um, they keep working until their their grand old age. I mean, if you look at some of the richest people in the world, I mean Warren Warren Buffett must be pushing the the hundred now, um, and and still you know a major player. So business people, they it's in the blood, I think, and and business opportunity never kind of stops for them. So as long as FSGC Liverpool is an important part of their business, I, I think they'll keep hold of it. There were reportedly a couple of other potential bidders as well. Do we know anything about them? And was that more a case, do you think, of people just testing the water just in case there was any sort of indication that FSG might be open to this? I think it's a, a, a status thing now. We've seen, uh, from what we can gather, it was, you know, other, other reported interest has been from, from the Middle East as well. Um, and, and, and while on one hand we we kind of decry the involvement of, of kind of oil money in, in terms of driving up prices and and, and the transfer market, um, the same token you, you do see some people say, oh, you kind of want this to happen. So um, Liverpool Liverpool could reach those levels, but ultimately, I mean, it's I, I don't think any of those are, are really um, they're probably baseless at the moment. Um, I went to the fact that. But having said that, the only people who, who really have got that kind of money to spend on, on football clubs at the moment um, is possibly people in the mid, in the Middle East or or kind of um, Russian oligarchs or, or private invest or private equity firms. Um, certainly, individuals um, with altruism and, and wanting to spend their money, um, like Jack Walker did at Blackburn, albeit on a bigger scale, all those years ago. I just don't think these people exist at the moment. Um, and, and I don't think I don't think any any owner that comes in, um, if FSG did sell or, or to any other football club at the top level of English football, um, is making a, a is going to be making a huge difference to 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 the, the conversation we've been having over the past week in terms of getting football back to to its roots and, and putting the fans at the heart of everything. Um, I think it will either be you know people who can buy clubs at this level, um, it's either vanity or it is. Um, it's because it's a good business move, um, and or it's both. So um, I don't know. We're, we're in a strange situation. I, I I don't think, my own personal opinion, I don't think any owners will snap from what's happened during this past week. I think they'll retreat. I mean, people have been protesting about the Glazers since two thousand five, um, and they are their their kind of shield has always been Ed Woodward. Now he's gone. I suppose they've got to make themselves slightly more visible until they find another lightning rod for their hostility. Um, but for the most part, they've kept themselves over in the states and focused on other in, uh, their other interests. Um, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Will FSG do the same with um, Liverpool? I mean, and, and I mean, let's be honest, they made that video apology from the the halls of the Boston Red Sox, didn't they? So um, I think they'll just stay out the limelight for as much as they can now um, and see what kind of wounds heal if they do, uh, and then maybe take stock. Uh, once we start to kind of find our way out of the pandemic and and and, and see whether long term football has been um, impacted severely. Yeah, absolutely. It's going to be an interesting few months. I think the European Super League last week, the financial accounts this week. It's been a busy couple of weeks for you, Dave. So thank you very yes. much for for taking the time to join me. Thanks, Matt. Thanks very much. We'll have, of course, all the extra details to come out over the next few days on what these accounts mean, and Dave will be, of course, all over that for the rest of this week can of course look across twitter across the liverpool echoes website and blood red for all of that stuff we'll have all of the updates as we have them if you've not signed up to the blood red newsletter yet make sure you do that in the link in the description but until next time here on the bottom line podcast it's goodbye for now